Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, another calm week. I say calm because everything that's happening these days, I compare to what occurred under the Trump administration where we were in deep chaos, we were aggravated, et cetera, et cetera, every week. Uh, there was no rest and re- re- relaxation. He kept hitting, hitting, and hitting. At least with Joe Biden, he's getting things done more than Trump did and in a much quieter professional fashion. Now, we're going to do a little traveling tonight. We're going to be in Key West, Washington, D.C., Moscow, the southwest border, Syracuse, Miami, South Beach, Asia, Boulder, Colorado, the Vatican, and San Francisco. I want to start with Key West. Um, I rarely get to Key West anymore, it seems, and that's because I've been self-quarantined now. I think this is my 388th day. Isn't that amazing? But in three weeks, I'm out of here (laughs) because I get my second shot this Saturday. And then from what I understand, two weeks, stay in, don't fool around, and then you can go out. I can't wait to sit in a bar and have a glass of beef feeder on the rocks. That That's my goal in life now. It's the only thing I desire. Anyhow, let's talk about Key West. Nice place here. But we've taken the beating down here with the pandemic. Uh, coronavirus has killed us. Duval Street is dead. Storefronts closed up, covered with paper boards, uh, and many in the busiest blocks, like the second, third, and third blocks of Duval Street, where most of the action is, especially that second block, a Sloppy Joe's block. Sloppy Joe's open, but the bars aren't, just aren't open. <laughs> uh, they're closed, they're gone, and some new ones have come back. Uh, Duval Street took a big beating. And it's interesting Uh, We lost a lot of bars. We lost a lot of restaurants. We lost a lot of stores that just ran some businesses that were compatible with Key West. So guess what came out this past week? In spite of all the businesses left, in spite of all the bars gone, Key West has opened eight new restaurants during the pandemic. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Eight people had the guts to go out and put their money where their mouth was and take a shot at making a buck. In in the worst possible economic situation. And I I, I admire them. It's, It's a big gamble, but they're out there, and I wish them good luck. Now, let's stay with Key West. You're going to love what I'm going to share with you now. Do you remember playing Monopoly? Do you remember you played it as a child? I can remember playing Monopoly back in 1940. You played it as a child. Uh, You played it with your parents. You played it with your wife before you, you were married. You played it with your wife after you were married. You played with it, with Monopoly with your children. You played with Monopoly with your grandchildren. Well, here's the story. There's a new Monopoly set coming out, and it's going to be Key West Monopoly. Yep, Key West Monopoly. And it's going to be part of the original uh, game that's been out there for years. A young businessman, probably age 35 to 40, by the name of Casey Arnold here in Key West, okay? Uh, He's a local business owner. Uh, He took the Monopoly game and gave it some twists and turns and added this and subtracted that and came up with a new board, a new Monopoly board, a new Monopoly game that referred to everything Key West. Everything's the same. The game's played the same. But what you look at and what you do involves Key West. There's still hotels and motels. They didn't change that. I'd rather hotels and houses. But everything else has changed, though it looks the same. He went, this Casey Arnold, went to Hasbro uh, Gaming, 
They are the ones that own Monopoly. And he sat down and he talked with them. He says, here's my idea. And do you know what? They gave him permission to proceed, okay? They gave him permission to proceed. It's going to be a big-time reflection on Key West. And here's some of the things that are changed. The tokens, for example. It's going to have a Kino sandal, a slice of key lime pie, a rooster, a conch shell, a manatee, and a fishing boat. Uh, it's good. The game is coming out this fall in time for people to buy it up for Christmas presents. I can see it happening in my family. I can see Robert and Allie, someone giving them the game. Maybe Papa, I don't know. And uh, we'll be sitting down and playing Monopoly. I have not played Monopoly in years. The last time I played the game was with Robert and Allie, probably 10 years ago. So it's an interesting thing and great thought factor that this Casey Arnold put into this. Let's have a key West Monopoly set. Okay, now we go to Joe Biden. i got a few things I want to say. Uh, I admire Joe Biden. I'm a Democrat. That's nothing to do with it. The man has class. Uh, the man acts responsibly. His, his judgments seem thought out. And so far, don't forget, he's only been president 58 days. I think he's doing a hell of a job. You know, he, he, he got the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. And other good things are in the process of happening. Well, this past week, Joe Biden was interviewed on national television. And the interviewer asked him about Putin. And did he consider Putin? Did he, Joe Biden, consider Putin a killer? And Joe Biden calmly said, yes. No hesitancy. Yes, he's a killer. Uh it's amazing. You never would have heard Donald Trump saying he's a killer. And I doubt any president in the last few presidents we have had would have had the courage to come out and say it openly because you always want to keep on good terms with another country. Anyhow, he said it, uh, and it's out there. And so we know who stands where, okay? And during the course of this interview, Biden also said, and I quote, that Putin will pay a price, quote-unquote, Putin will pay a price for his effort to undermine the 2020 United States election. Now, Biden said during the campaign and when, and in January before he took office that within 100 days, my first 100 days as president, I will see to it that 100 million vaccines are completed. 100 million vaccines for to defeat coronavirus will be done. Now, that's a pretty heavy load. But he says, I'm going to do it. And guess what? He did it. The 100 days aren't even over yet. But on the 58th day, on the 58th day, it was sometime last week. On the 58th day, he hit the 100 million mark. And on national television, he said over the weekend, I'm going to do even better between now and the end of 100 days, though he did not give a number this time. But the man's on a roll. How can you knock him? He's terrific. You know, remember what Trump supporters always said during during his campaigns and while he was president. You know, he makes a promise, keeps a promise. Makes a promise, keeps a promise. <laughs> the only promise he ever kept was to cut taxes for the rich. And he did. Uh, at least so far, in less than two months, we have seen Joe Biden uh, keep one of his promises. 100 million doses of the vaccine, coronavirus vaccine, in his first 100 days. Staying now with uh, the president, uh, I can remember, I'm a student of history. I was a history major. I love history. I love stories about what happened in the past. That's how I view them. They are, the past are is stories. Okay, uh, 
I can remember when a million dollars, I can remember, historically, there was a time that our first budgets in this country were in the thousands of dollars. Then we moved on to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then we moved on to a million dollars. I can remember million dollar budgets when I was younger. Then we hit the billion dollar mark and everybody said, oh my God, how are we ever going to pay this money back? And uh, everyone said, lots of money. And now, my friends, we have met the, th- the trillion dollar, the trillion dollar mark. I can't even conceive of how much money that is. Uh, and we're going to go, we're going to have more added on to this trillion. Remember, uh, Biden ha- has gotten the uh, Stimulus Act passed. It's now law. People are already receiving their checks this week. Some for thousands of dollars, the way this thing's set up, not just the fourteen hundred. Uh, it's a good deal if you got a wife and you got a few kids. It's a money making thing for the next year. But his idea is you got to throw money out there so people will spend the money, which will get the economy going, and then everything should reverse itself. We'll see. Don't know. Anyhow, uh, the biggest thing that anyone ever passed in this. In this country is the $1.9 trillion. Uh, and that you can attribute to Joe Biden. Well, now he announced yesterday that he's going after infrastructure. That's on the table now. They're putting it together for the House. And the infrastructure bill is going to be $3 trillion. Can you imagine $3 trillion on top of one point nine? That's $5 trillion. Plus what we had before going into it in the billions. It's wild. I hope everything works out. I have a feeling we have nothing else to do. Everything has to have a big number to keep us from going into a deep recession. We're into one, but it's not deep. we got to get ourselves out before it is deep. And it lasts like 10 years as the 1929 Depression did. Uh, now, understand this about infrastructure. It will create jobs. It can help but create jobs. It's inevitable that jobs will be created. And it's very simple. Infrastructure means New highways, repair old highways. New bridges, repair old bridges. New schools, new roofs on schools. New public buildings. This is big stuff. You're going to do this all over the country, all 50 states, beginning at the same time. Okay, beginning at the same time. Uh, You can't miss because... All of a sudden, there's going to be money through the $3 trillion to pay people to go back to work for construction companies. People will make things that will be required to build these things. And there's cash flow now, big time. And then people are not going to be afraid. They'll have the money to go out and buy extra things and go to places like the movie, take the wife out to dinner one night a week and things like that. That can't be done now. Forget the infection factor. You just don't have the money in your pocket. Uh, so that's going to help the, the the recovery immensely, the economic recovery. Going to have a problem with the Republicans. I can see uh, McCullough right now, Mitch McCullough. He's going to be standing there saying, oh, my God, too much money. He didn't care when they give trillion, a trillion-dollar tax cut to the rich under Trump. But, oh, too much money. Must watch the economy. He could care less. He just does not want any Democratic president to succeed, and he has proven it over the last 10 years. So, Joe Biden has to get rid of the filibuster. If he doesn't, we're not going to accomplish anything as Democrats. This is the time this country needs a man like Joe Biden. He can do it. Sounds like I'm campaigning for him. I'm not campaigning. I have faith and confidence in the man. But the filibuster will kill him. So he's got to, he's going to change the filibuster. I don't think he'll eliminate it immediately, but I'll bet you by July the filibuster will be dramatically different. It'll just be where someone who wants to oppose a vote on the bill, that would be a Republican senator, has to stand up and talk and talk and talk and can't sit down. He doesn't even have to say anything intelligent. 
I remember. I, I, I've seen the old filibusters. They would read from dictionaries, from encyclopedias, anything they could find to keep going. Once they stopped, the opposition would stand up and say, I want an immediate vote because by filibustering, they were, were preventing the vote. So, And then by the end of the year, I can see them throwing the filibuster out because the two recalcitrant Democratic senators will have seen the light of day, I think, and understand, or at least I hope so. Now, let me tell you the benefit of infrastructure. It was 1954 and 1955. I was in college, sophomore, junior. I'm home for the summer. I need a job. Uh, I was talking to the father of uh, one of my classmates, and I told him I'm looking for a job, and he says, he wrote on a piece of paper the name of this fella, and he says he's working on the federal highway job outside of Rome, New York. Rome's 14 miles from Utica. He says, you go see him. I will call him and tell him to be looking out for you, and I, I think he'll be able to help you. So I went out. I was there the next day. And, you know, the construction of highways, this was big. They were going left and right, overhead and everything else. I find this fellow, he's, he's the, the union man on the job. He's the boss. And he doesn't work, but he walks around. He's the boss. Tough-looking guy. I was intimidated, I'll be honest. I weighed all of 115 pounds. Here's this giant, this man with muscles and all that sort of stuff. Anyhow, I, I said, I am. And he said, I knew you were coming. We talked a bit. And he looked at me and inferred as many people who haven't had a college education but are in a position of power, you know, dumbass college kid. He didn't say it, but here's a dumbass college kid. I have to give him a job. He can't get a job on his own. Well, he asked me what I could do. He asked if I could drive a truck, a dump truck. I said, never drove a dump truck. Have driven big buses, taxi cabs, things like that, but not a dump truck. I've driven a milk wagon where you have to stand up driving. Uh, I said, so how hard can it be? All right. All right, so he gave me a job driving a dump truck. I had a big dump truck, but it was easy. Uh, the shifting I already knew from the bus and everything else uh, and the milk truck. So I get in my, I sat in this big dump truck, and I would drive to where a fellow told me to stop. I would stop. They would load my truck up in the back with dirt and rocks and everything else, and I was told to go on, and I was pointed to a certain location, and I, you drove very slowly because there was a line of these trucks. There, it's just like when you see World War II movies and you see this line of, of trucks or jeeps or tanks going in a straight line someplace. And I go until I saw the guy with his hand up and pointing here, and that's where I dumped the load, and then I would turn around and drive back where it started. Let me tell you the benefit of that job. I made so much money, I can't tell you. I joined the union. I got union wages. Big dollars back then. I can't recall the exact amount, but it was big dollars. And I got the benefit of some bonuses these guys got because uh, it was retroactive, and even though I wasn't there, this is the union. I got two bonuses I, I don't think I deserve. But I made a good buck, and it helped me tremendously with my next year of college. And that's what a, uh, a uh, infrastructure job can do for anyone. Staying with Joe Biden, here is the one negative I have. This southern border, this kid with this situation with the immigrant children coming over, he's getting killed. I'm going to say not defensively. I'm going to say it. More are coming over than even, than even came over under Trump. Kids, they come along. Thousands, by the thousands, they come every day, every week. We're, we're not equipped to handle them. They don't understand. They think Trump's going to arrange for them to come in because he's going to be, he likes immigrants. He's going to take care of everybody. Uh, but not yet. He hasn't been president two months yet. Give him a break. So we have a problem. The children are not being handled much better than Trump did. A little bit better, but not much better. And Biden looks bad on this one because he has refused to give access to the press, 
on the southern border to see how these children are being handled. He has refused to answer questions concerning it. In fact, he hasn't had one press conference yet. You notice every, he's on television a lot, giving a, 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 a statement every day or making a comment. But as soon as he's done, he turns around and walks off. He doesn't blink an eyelash while everybody's yelling questions at him. Well, I, I'm sure he will straighten it out. It's a difficult situation, but he's the president, and that's his job. And I have faith and confidence in the man. Now, the best thing that happened in the past seven, eight days, Syracuse basketball. Uh, those of you who follow college basketball, Many of you I know who listen follow Syracuse basketball. Wasn't it great this past weekend? I complained on this show during the entire basketball season. I wrote in my blog that I put out every morning about Syracuse basketball. I said, how could this be? We have the greatest individual athletes. Each member of that team is a star in his own right. They're talented. And they weren't winning games. They were getting their asses handed to them. It's the only way I can describe it. You know, you need that thing where the team gels at some point, and then it starts playing like a team all the time. We didn't reach that point. If you recall, two weeks ago, I was saying we're not going to the fun. we're not going to the big tournament. Can't make it. I said it for a couple of weeks before the season ended. I don't even think Syracuse won 20 games. I think we were 19 and 12 or something like that. A terrible record. Should not even be in the tournament, I thought. But I don't know how they figured it out. Syracuse not only got in, but it was a number 11 seed in the Midwest region. Not bad, number 11. Because the two times we went to the Final Four, we were either 10, 11, or 12. And there's 16 seeds in each of the four regions. Well, the first game was, what was it, Friday. It was Friday against uh, San Diego State. Don't think, oh, well, what's San Diego State? It sounds like a small college. It's a basketball dynasty. We don't hear about them much in the East. They had a hell of a season, and they were the sixth seed. Syracuse is the 11th. Six is better than 11. San Diego was supposed to beat us. We whipped their asses. 16-point victory, the finest basketball game in 30 years that I have seen a Syracuse team play. No question about it. So impressed. I, I, I don't know whose genius was involved. I said to myself, they said, these guys belong here. Now comes Sunday, and, and now we're playing, who do we play in? West Virginia. West Virginia is a number three seed. Syracuse remembers an eleven. West Virginia is much, much better than Syracuse, allegedly. There was a sportcaster's talk show before the game, uh, and they talked about Syracuse, West Virginia, and about Syracuse. They gave us all of 15 seconds. I'm not minimizing. I'm not exaggerating. They said something in you know, Syracuse. They're lucky to be in. They got in. They're playing West Virginia. They spent the next five, six minutes talking only about West Virginia. What a great team they were. How they should have been the first seed. They're going to destroy Syracuse. We beat number three seeded West Virginia. It was a good game. We were ahead by 14 in the first half. We won by three. But it was that kind of a game in the second half. Two talented teams. We won. Now, this weekend, we're, going, we're in the Sweet 16 now. It's a big deal. We play Houston. Houston is the number two seed. Okay? So Syracuse, number 11, is going to play a number two seed, which is a team that, by numbers and ratings, is better than Syracuse. Obviously, it's a number two seed. Going to be an interesting game. I don't know where we're going. I had no faith in my team. I'm, I, I'll openly admit it. It was a terrible season. The last few seasons have been terrible with Syracuse basketball, which is never terrible. And I was down. I was down on my school. Uh, they're doing well. If they don't go any farther than this weekend, I don't care. I'm happy that they got this far because they they did it well. They've done it well in the last two games. This is big deal stuff. I hope they win. Uh, I'd like to see them go to the Final Four. Time will tell. Where are we now? Ah, South Beach, Miami. Well, 
what can I tell you? The spring breakers this year, I've spoken about this last week and the week before, I decided Miami was the place to be during spring break. Every year these kids seem to pick out some place in Miami. So they went, and of course they wanted to be the South Beach, which is about 16 blocks along the beach. And if you've never been, it's a place to go. It's fun time, really fun time. Uh, it's big time fun time. Uh, everyone has a good time. That's all I can tell you on South Beach. It's wild. Now, of course, with spring break, you're going to have more kids than normal because these college kids are come, going to come in. Well, too many came in. I forget the number. Like 8,000 were on South Beach. Impossible to hold. Uh, they already had a curfew before they came down. Miami said you got to be off the streets at midnight. You can't come back on at 6 in the morning. Thursday night must have been very bad. I'm going to quote, I'm going to repeat some quotes the mayor uh, spoke to make you appreciate it. Uh, because he went on TV and dropped the curfew to 8 o'clock at night. They had to get off the street. But he said things like, this is a state of emergency. Uh, we are overwhelmed. Uh, the last... They find the airlines to an extent. The last month uh, you could get here from Philadelphia, New York, or Chicago for $50 round trip. Uh, he said the crowds were more than we could handle. He said they're coming without intention of following the rules. He further said the result is a level of chaos and disorder that is something more than we can endure. Add on to that. Uh, the nighttime when they were out in the street, it feels like a rock concert, okay? Wall-to-wall -wall people. This is in the street. Hotels on one side, the beach on the other, over blocks and blocks. And he added to that, South Beach feels like a tinder. It, it, it feels like just any match will set it off. Okay, now what do I want to say about all this? I got people that call me. I hear from Europe. I hear from. I even hear from Asia, Indonesia, <laughs> Thailand, South Africa. I'm big in South Africa. I've been for years. Don't ask me why. And they call me when something happens over there. Or they email me. Well, someone called me from South Beach yesterday, and said, "Here's the story, Lewis. The there's a lot of a lot of people here for spring break. They are not all college students. They're not even college student age. This person, she, it was a woman, she said, they're more young professionals. That's how she described them. In their early 20s and up to their early 30s. You can tell, she said, by the way they look, by the way they carry themselves, and the way they dress as opposed to the college students. And they're the ones that are really, really racing the hell, she said. Interesting. I share it. That was her interpretation. That was her impression. And share it with you. My concern is, and they did this during uh, several months ago when Miami was tough and Key West was open. They said, we're going to Key West. We're not going to stay in Miami. Key West is an open town. Sounds like the old West, doesn't it? Tombstone. And they came down and brought coronavirus big time with them. I expect them back this week. It's inevitable. They're going to come here because everything goes in Key West right now. And I'm laughing. It's sad because they bring the book back. And that isn't correct. That isn't right. That isn't necessary. Okay. That's the story for my show tonight. I hope you enjoyed so many things I didn't cover. Child suicide, big, big because of the virus. I'll talk about that next week. It's horrible. Anyhow, thank you for joining me. Good show, I thought, tonight. Interesting topics out there. Uh, come back next week. Join me again. Many of you are loyal. Some new. I hope you new, new listeners enjoyed. Uh, my numbers go up every week. I, I, I really don't know why I'm impressed. That's a terrible thing to say. I'm impressed. But I love it, So, and I love doing this show. Nice to be with you. I look forward to being with you again next week. Ten.